will start at 7.30. So good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining our weekly CAT conference. Um, we have a good friend, Alvin Caddy. Alvin has really been at the forefront of coronary interventions and numerous randomized clinical control trials. Um, he's now become the, I just learned right now, looking at his slide, the director of the Innovation Clinic at the University in Brussels. And congratulations, Edwin. And it's so good to see you again, my friend. Same for me. So we're looking forward to your insights on vulnerable plaque. I mean, this has remained a topic that I think most of us struggle with. Uh, it's something we always hoped we could identify and will allow us to prevent MI. So I'm really looking forward to what the new insights are. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and for the good job you guys are doing there by organizing this course for fellows. I choose this topic because it's a topic that it's in my, uh, has been in my focus of interest since the times I was myself a fellow. And uh, without further delay, I will share with you what the knowledge we had about the vulnerable plaque and what the vulnerable plaque is, as the term vulnerable means, is a plaque that is vulnerable of giving future events. And the anatomopathologic studies have shown that these plaques have some characteristics. Uh, these are studies done from the group from Birmani and Burke, and they have shown that these plaques have a large lipid core. They are often uh, surrounded by a thin cap, thin fibrous cap, they are also rich in macrophages, and these macrophages produce metalloproteinases, which then further thinner this cap and make it uh, prone to rupture. They also are poor in small, uh, small, uh, smooth muscle cells, and often they have not necessarily a severe grade of stenosis, although this concept have moved in the last time, in the recent times. Uh, as it can shown more in the detail on the right side, you can see a lipid core, a thinning of the uh, uh, smooth muscle cells and these activated macrophages that produce this metal of proteinases and those is in, is in gross, the process is more than that, but uh, this is in gross what happens to a plaque that ruptures. Similarly, you have also cholesterol clusters. Uh, clusters into this necrotic core. And also another thing uh, that is characteristic of this plaque is the narrow revascularization. Uh, okay. All right, so now we have also uh, not only histology, but we could, by means of OCT, see most of those uh, characteristics of a vulnerable plaque, as is shown in the right uh, upper part of the slide. This is a, a, here you could see a design of a, a, a vulnerable plaque. As I said, you have the necrotic core, you have the uh, intraplaque hemorrhage, you have spotty calcifications, you have the fibrous cap that is, if it's less than 65 micrometers, we call it a thin cap, and clearly the neorevascularization. All these are very clearly visible also on OCT. As you could see here, you could see clearly the lipid pool. You could see here the overlying uh, thin cap fibroadroma with the measurement of 60. You could see, as you could see in the left side of the slide more in detail, uh, you could see here the macrophage accumulation clip close to the, uh, the thinner, uh, to the thin cap. You could see uh, calcium uh, calcifications into the intima and all uh, microvascularizations, all these uh, here you could see cholesterol uh, crystals, uh, pardon, uh, uh, cholesterol crystals and uh, also the neurovascularization. So now we have so practically the tools to show and visibly view these plaques also live in our patients. Of course, another way of looking to this is through IVUS and NIRS. NIRS does the identification of uh, lipid content into the lumen and uh, classifies it based on the uh, uh, density of the lipid on the lumen wall and assumes that the, uh, together with the uh, images that you get from IVUS, that this uh, represents the necrotic core of a plaque of a fibroadroma. 
The most insights that we have actually from the role of the vulnerable plaque and one of the studies that has been to the basis of all future research has been the prospect study done by Dr. Stone. Uh, this is a, a relatively old study now, but this gave us the first insights on the role of the Thinca, Fibroid, Veroma and other characteristics as plaque burden and a minimum lumen area, all uh, parameters that are uh, that impact, in fact, the, the, the future events. And as shown in the slide, which is the most uh, relevant findings of the prospect trial between others, is that the TICFA alone uh, clearly is related to a higher event rate than patients without TICFA. If you uh, uh, accumulate TICFA with minimum lumen area, so in combination, this doubles. Uh, if you uh, at the plaque burden more than 70% to thin cap fibroteroma as the event rate goes up to 16, 17%. And if you have all three factors, it goes close to 20%. On the other side, if you have non-lipidic plaque, so non-fibroateromas, the event coming from those, the event rate coming from those are very low. And the impact also of a plaque burden of minimum lumen area is clearly not enough to, uh, to warrant further attention. So these are really patients that have very little events. Looking again into fibroateromas, but not thin, but thick cap fibroateroma. So in our definition, but uh, is more than 65 microns, but you have to remember that at the time IVOS resolution was only 150. So uh, these are the definitions done by, uh, the, the study was then done by IVOS, so the thickness are also uh, uh, as IVOS interpreted. But then again, also here, the thin cap fibroid aromas have a very low event rate and it is clearly, uh, if we can parallel this to the slide I showed before, that TICVA has twice, twofold more mace than the thick cap fibroteromas. So between fibroteromas, having a thin cap, already we knew that from the prospect, uh, is associated a twofold uh, increase in event rate. Now, I have to tell you that uh, uh, the, the, the prospect identified of course, some clinical uh, aspects related to future vulnerability like diabetes and particular insulin requiring diabetes, previous percutaneous intervention. But uh, importantly, they found that plaque burden was the most important, plaque burden more than 70% was the most important uh, predictor. And in fact, if you correlate that to a diameter stenosis, this comes to already an intermediate plaque, so around 45% or higher than that. The other factor is a minimum lumen area less than four millimeters. So by pure math, this represents a diameter of stenosis 2.5, which we often find in lesions that we see. But of course, prospect limitation was that no FFR was performed in that study. And the resolution of IBUS, as I said, is about 150. So anything under that would not, it is not visible, so we assume these are thin cap fibroid aromas, but in fact, they could still be thick cap fibroid aromas. And the stenosis severity that was studied in this study was low and clinically not really meaningful. We were talking about diameter of steno average diameter of stenosis of the lesions that were studied there, about 20-30%. These are lesions that in clinical life we will not even consider of doing an FFR there. And uh, so these automatically trans translate to lower plaque burden and minimum lumen area. Now, two other studies were based on prospect to continue into looking into the impact of, uh, of vulnerable plaque on future adverse events, and that were prospect two and combined. So I told you already what the importance is of target intermediate stenosis. So a plaque burden more than 70 and diameter stenosis more than 45 lessons we learned from the first prospect trial. Now the prospect trial did also took again, started from again, low rate stenosis. They did a very systematically thorough uh, uh, study of NIRS, they used NIRS. And uh, while the combined uh, started already from intermediate lesions, so our patients had already a more than uh, 40 
percent uh, diameter stenosis, which translate already to a plug burden of 75, uh, 74, 75 percent. The NIRS does not have the capacity to identify TICFA, while the OCT used in the combined does. Both studies used FFR, so lesions were FFR negative. Uh, NIRS has an excellent capacity to identify lipid, but lipid is also visible in uh, OCT, and we can identify if it's lipid or calcium due to some characteristics that has been described in many, many uh, literature pieces. And uh, also both studies focused on high-risk patients. The prospect uh, focused on patients with the MI, so in the non-culprit lesions with patients of the MI, with the MI, while the combine also had high-risk patients. And we were clearly based on prospect because we took diabetes patients and with or without MI. And a high percentage of patients had infected. Am I also, despite having also diabetes on top? So I will go shortly and describe you the uh, what the prospect uh, natural history study was, and uh, so they took all patients with the troponin positive, so ACS patients, and after successful PCI of the culprit, uh, they performed IVUS and NIRS and uh, uh, in in uh, 902 patients. Then they looked to the IVUS findings and they uh, found uh, and they, they divided the patients in plug burden more than 75 or not. They found that 182 patients had a plug burden of more than 65%. And these patients went to another study. Let's say that was this was a program. So this other study was absorbed diabetes. And these were randomized into uh, a treatment with absorbed, preventive treatment with absorbed versus optimal medical treatment, while the other patients with the plug burden less than 65 were prospectively followed into uh, uh, in a natural history register. That was the, the prospect study. Uh, the primary endpoint was a cardiac death, myocardial infarction, unstable angina pectoris or pro uh, progressive angina pectoris attributed to originally non-culprit lesions. The statistical analysis, the slide is a bit uh, busy, but I'll try to explain to you. The principal study uh, objective was to establish the covariate adjusted relationship between high risk characteristics of untreated non culprit lesions and su subsequent in a patient level and in a lesion level outcomes. These plaques, uh, these high risk untreated plaque characteristics, were specified as lipid rich plaque defined as the upper quartile of max LCDI for all non-culprit lesions. The maximum plaque burden, more than 70. Minimum lumen area, more than four millimeters squared. Each individual risk plaque characteristic was introduced in a separate multivariable model in a hierarchical order with LPR followed by plaque burden and minimum lumen uh, area to account for multiplicity. So look at the uh, red surrounded uh, quadrant. Here you have the characteristics of, uh, uh, of patients with non-culprit and the event rates on those. Uh, the major event uh, arrived in 8%. Myocardial infarction was 3.2%. Uh, these were, of course, could not be procedure related because the patients were not treated. Uh, progressive angina and unstable angina accounted for about 5.5% and patients requiring for revascularization 3.1 with rapid progression of those were 1.4. And you could see here that uh, for 78 first non-culprit maze events, uh, these, uh, they showed that there was a progression in the plaque from about 47% to uh, 69%. Among this 78 non-culprit lesions, only 56.4% uh, were imaged by NIRS IVUS, and they had a plaque burden of at least 56.2. Uh, median max LCBI was 473, and uh, six, about 70% of uh, these patients had a uh, LCBI more than 324. Now, here is how it breaks down into patient levels. And this is how it breaks down into lesion level events uh, regarding the upper quartile of max LCBI. Now, as you could see here, uh, 
even those those with uh, uh, those with uh, higher LCBI had a higher event rate. Although, if you look to a lesion rate, uh, lesion level events, the event rates remain low, 3.8. Uh, if we look to the plaque burden, on a patient level, there is a clear difference with the odds ratio of nine in favor of those who had a higher plaque burden. And if we look to lesion level events of, uh, of plaque burden more than 70 versus those with lower plaque, also here is 4.6 to 0 0.4. And if we look to the minimum lumen area, also here those with a smaller lumen area are uh, doing worse than those with uh, a, a, a larger lumen area than 4.0. Although again, also here on lesion level events, although the odds radio is almost five, the, 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 the total number of events or the percentage of events remains low, it's 2.6. And here you could have an, a, a clear view of what were the events that drove the primary endpoint. And you could see it here divided for uh, on terms on, on terms of LCBI or plaque burden or minimum lumen area, more less than four. But you have to, when you look to this data, understand that the plaque burden and minimum lumen area were not excluded when we were talking with lesions with a higher LCBI more than 324. That is the upper quartile. So uh, you could see that uh, there is a clear higher uh, myocardial infarction uh, and uh, also progressive angina in these patients. And the total maze was also higher. The odds radio was 2.4. For the plaque burden, which the same was observed, although the, the, the odds radio for, the non, for, for, for maze was three, so higher than that provided from the LCBI, and for the minimum lumen area less than four, the, the odds radio of was 5.5. And here is after doing a multivariate models for those culprit lesions, you could see that on a lesion level, the factor that impacted the most was not the LCBI, but actually was the plug burden more than 70, as we have seen previously from the pre prospect one. And then are these uh, fatty lesions, so the, the, the lesions with a high uh, lipid index as shown by NEARS, with a 7 point, uh, almost 8 uh, odds ratio. And then comes the minimum lumen area. Interestingly, is to show that uh, this is now on lesion level, and there the plaque burden becomes the. So these are lesions focused and studied with NEARS. Those with plaque burden more than 70, this, this plaque burden also on lesion level has the first place followed for LCBI and then followed for minimum lumen area. And this is very interesting to, and here the authors did, decided to look to the impact of a plaque burden and lipid plaque as with the LCBI more than 324. And the event rate then is clearly higher than the other type of plaques. However, if we look to the effect of max LCBI alone, so without a plaque burden more than 70, it remains very low, so it's 1.3%. This is very significant, uh, and uh, it is interesting to say that to keep in mind that these plaques actually uh, had a very low uh, diameter of stenosis, something between again uh, starting from about 22 percent to, to 35 percent, and also the plaque burden was less than 65 percent. And despite if you accumulate those, the event rates could still these could still give you seven percent of uh, events during a, about a four year follow up. Uh, looking into the prospect absorb uh, uh, trial, the randomized, uh, this was a pilot sort of study and look at the concept of revascularizing these lesions uh, with a high plug burden and uh, rich on lipid as shown by NEARS. The study uh, did a one by one and co uh, compared uh, absorb treatment with uh, uh, optimal medical treatment alone. Uh, of course, was not powered for major outcomes, was powered for minimum lumen area at uh, protocol driven 25 months follow up, but also had a non powered safety endpoint for target lesion failure and also for MACE. And these are the events for the primary endpoint. These are results of the baseline. Of course, the ones who get revascularized get the primary endpoint significantly, so the study could reach its primary endpoint. 
looking at the secondary endpoint, there were no difference in target lesion revascularization. Uh, so these patients did similar uh, on terms of uh, target lesion failure at uh, 24 months uh, between absorbed BVS or uh, optimal, medical uh, optimal medical treatment. Well, things got a bit different in terms of MACE. Here, there is a clear difference with people that getting revascularization, having lower event rates uh, compared to uh, people who got revascularized, uh, who did not got revascularized. And this gives uh, some sign of uh, maybe that uh, this data could be used further as a pilot to, to prompt uh, further larger studies. Uh, though, again, looking at the impact of the events that happened, it was, of course, higher in the medical, uh, in the medical treatment, almost double, did not reach significant, but this was mainly driven by need for revascularization due to progressive angina. There were no differences on death. In fact, nobody, uh, no patient died in both arms. The rate of myocardial infarction was similar. Luckily, there were no periprocedural uh, infarctions, but uh, during the spontaneous infarctions during follow-up was similar in both arms. Of course, the study, as I said, was very uh, small to look to these uh, 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 composites of this endpoint, and therefore, this could be used only as exploratory. So in conclusion, the author said that the present RCT BBS implantation in angiographically mild non-flow limiting lesions with large blood burden, small lumen areas and high lipid content was safe and substantially enlarged luminal dimensions during the follow-up. So this was their primary endpoint. The favorable randomized leisure related maze rates observed after BBS treatment compared with uh, medical treatment alone warrants the performance of an adequately powered randomized trial to determine whether PCI treatment of focal vulnerable plaques improve patients' outcomes. Another trial that uh, study, prospective study that happened, as I mentioned before, was a study I had the chance to, together with uh, a, a lot of dear colleagues to perform uh, mostly in uh, Europe. What we did into this trial, we, we combined the use of FFR and OCT to look for, uh, to look to, to better predict outcomes in diabetic patients. So we took diabetic patients because, as you know, diabetics uh, has the fastest progression of atherosclerosis. So we thought that if we don't see any effect on those patients, then maybe we should forget about the vulnerable plaque. But uh, so what we did is we performed FFR in all patients with intermediate stenosis, so 40 to 80 percent, by saying that I already say you that these all had a plaque burden more than 70. They had diabetes, and uh, we then further divide the performed PCI in the group that had FFR that was negative, and this was a sort of a control arm for us. And then we further took the patients with a negative FFR, so 0 0.80, and in the core lab, we, did, we performed OCT, of course, in those patients, and in the core lab, they were divided into having a thin cap fibroadroma or not. When I'm saying that they had a thin cap fibroadroma, means that they were all uh, fibroadromas first, uh, first, and then they also had a thin cap. While the group that was stigma negative, there was a mix of fibroadromas and non fibroadromas. The primary endpoint was to show that actually the high risk group, those with fibroadromas and thick, thin cap, they had a higher, they'll have a higher endpoint uh, of MACE during the follow up than patients without these characteristics. So this would uh, bring to the idea that OCT could identify those lesions that could be prone to future events. And the secondary endpoint was comparing the group that had a high risk plaque, so those with TICFA, with the group that got revascularization. And as I said, they both started from intermediate lesions. So in the end, angiographically, they represent the same type of patients with the same kind of lesions. The primary endpoint was the incidence of target lesion-related maze defined as cardiac death, target myocardial infarction, clinically driven target lesion revascularization or hospitalization due to unstable or progressive angina at 18 months in the FFR negative thin cap fibroadroma patients versus FFR negative, no thin cap fibroadroma patients. And the key secondary endpoint, as I said, was the same as a primary endpoint, but compared the group that got revascularization with the high-risk group, so the TICFA group. And this is what we found. 
we had 550 patients, and uh, of those, uh, 423 had an FFR that was negative, and 112 had an FFR that was positive. And uh, from those 300 uh, that had FFR that was negative, 390 had a valid OCT. And these were divided, let's say, in uh, three-fourths that had no TICFA, and about 100 patients representing about 25 of the patients that had a TICFA. And from the 112 that had a uh, negative, a positive FFR, only 92 had, in the end, revascularization. And they were further taken into the analysis. Interestingly, the baseline PTPF of these patients was very similar in group A and B, and the same was also found for the FFR after adenosine. So the, the, the minimum lumen area tended to be slightly lower, but though not significantly lower in the TICFA group. Interestingly, TICFA was mostly located in longer lesions. It was significantly so that longer lesions were, had a higher chance of carrying a TICFA. Further, the proximal uh, and distal reference lumen diameters were similar in both groups with or without TICFA. Things got more, more interesting when we looked to the composition of the plaque. There were more calcified, uh, or the, let's say that the total calcification was similar in both arms, in TICFA and non-TICFA patients, although the calcium arc was clearly larger in patients without TICFA. Protruding calcification also more in patients without a TICFA, although it was also present in patients with TICFA. Interestingly, cholesterol cleft, a sign of vulnerability, were clearly higher, almost double in patients with thin cap fibroderoma. Uh, of course, uh, per definition, the thin cap fibroderomas were 100% lipidic, but I have to say you that in the group that did not have a TICFA, also about 60% were also fibroderomas, although the cap thickness did not uh, went below 65, and therefore they were called the non TICFA. Clearly, the lipid arc was also higher in the plaques with the thin cap fibroderoma, so was neurovascularization and also clearly macrophage infiltration. So not only these have TICFA, but also show a higher rate of inflammation. And these are the primary endpoints. As we prospected, we found 13.3% event rate despite uh, having uh, negative FFR versus 3.1. So there was a five times higher event rate in patients with TICFA versus those without TICFA. Here is the breakdown of the endpoints. As you could see, all infarctions occurred in the group with the thin cap fibroderoma and zero in the group without. Almost all revascularizations occurred in the group without uh, thin cap fibroderoma. And also the hospitalization due to unstable angina occurred also in the TICFA group. Although, as I said, this did not really impact MACE because all these patients also had a clinically driven revascularization. So they are counted into that 11% of revascularization you see there. And this is the secondary endpoint comparing, uh, comparing thin cap fibroderomas with FFR positive patients that went revascularization. Also here numerically was higher for TICFA, but did not reach significant. We will also not expect significance here. This was exploratory, as I mentioned. And also here, interestingly, the patients that did had a TICFA had clearly a higher impact on need for revascularization. And it's something that we've seen in all trials uh, where uh, patients with uh, this type of plaques are not revascularized. Although the number of target vessel MI seems similar in both groups, I have to specify that uh, uh, the blue ones representing the TICFA patients had spontaneous MIs where those close to the, uh, uh, those in the revascularizations had periprocedural MIs. So although numerically they are similar, the impact of these myocardial infarctions was different in those patients. And the multivariable Cox regression analysis showed that TICFA was a clear uh, predictor of future, event, uh, future events, as was also the minimum lumen area. But the strongest impact was thin cap fibroderoma. As we've seen also from other studies, previous PCI and MI presentation was associated with uh, somehow a trend towards higher 
uh, event rate did not reach significant, but the trend, as you could see, is clear. And this is also similar to what we've seen for, from all other uh, studies. This is how these kind of patients do behave. They have higher event rates of an average factor of hazard rate of about two, two and a half. So this is not new. What is new here is the fact that we found that TICFA has a five times, almost five times higher event rate than the others. So concluding on combined, I could say that 25% of all FFR negative lesions represent high risk plaques as assessed by OCT. Uh, impact of this high plaque is, we show that it's a strong predictor of future maze. The amplitude is close to five times more, so it's not little effect, it's a strong effect. And the new insights is that we are having thoughts about ischemia and future adverse events. Is it ischemia of plaque composition that leads to this? And I think that these two are two separate concepts that needs to be looked further. So combined FFR and OCT can improve the accuracy of high-risk lesion patient identification and should therefore be embraced. Now, when I talk about new insight, ischemia, future adverse events to a large extent are two separate concepts. A very nice study uh, that we've seen recently is the ischemia trial. As you could see, the fact that the ischemia trial looked to the ischemia driven revascularization versus medical treatment and did not show any difference in cardiac death, myocardial infarction, or hospitalization for a stable angina or resuscitated cardiac arrest. Interestingly though, if we look to the spontaneous MI here between patients that were revascularized and not revascularized, here the patients that were revascularized clearly had lower spontaneous MI. Although we have to say that also here, those patients had a 7% myocardial infarction and these were ischemia treated patients. So where do they 7% come from? And I asked this question to one of the investigators and uh, they are still looking to this, but my guess is that half of this, about 50% are unaddressed vulnerable lesions. So to show you why is that this is a very nice study coming from the friends of Korea and Japan. Uh, and they look to CT and FFR and the impact on event rates. And they had, uh, first of all, you have to see that similar to us, after doing about uh, 593, looking at about 600 patients, more than 400 were FFR negative. And uh, about, so as we always know, one third of the patients, a bit less than one third of the patients when you do an FFR, will be an FFR positive, meaning that two thirds of them, although being similar in the rest of the characteristics, will not be addressed. And interestingly, look at here what we're leaving behind. I told you before, what are the characteristics of future adverse events, minimum lumen area. You have numerically more and the ones you're leaving untreated than the ones you're treating. Plug burden, similar. You have low attenuating plaque, similar. So by doing an FFR only approach, you're leaving a lot of these plaques untreated and things go nicer. Here they represent in blue, you are represented the patients that have uh, more than three high risk plaques. In orange, the two high risk plaques. In gray, only one high risk plaque and no high risk plaque. And this shows that as the FFR becomes positive, you have more chance of having more vulnerability traits. But none, nevertheless, the majority of the patients that are FFR positive, they also have a high risk plaques. In fact, if you look here to the, how they distribute, is that you have more high risk plaques in the FFR negative numerically than in the FFR positive. And again here, these are the event rates coming depending from the percentage of FFR. But this is how we are treating now. We're treating the FFR negatives, but the FFR positives with high risk plaque are numerically more than, give more events than, uh, and, than the, the, the ones who, who were FFR negative. So 
this is a call for thinking again to the way we're doing revascularization. And this has triggered me, and I think this is a field that opens a lot of questions. So the questions that opens is the interplay between ischemia and vulnerability, and I open this question for a discussion eventually. Another question is, is lipid alone? Should it be necessary to identify lipid or is lipid with inflammation and TIGFA? What matters more from this and from which diameter of stenosis should we focus? Where do we still, when do we have to start peri eventually uh, image those patients? And is need for revascularization as events enough to perform revascularization at baseline? or strong impact events like myocardial or death are required to power a study? And what would be an unacceptable cut of value of death and MI beyond that revascularization should consider? These are questions in my head and with this, I would like to uh, open the discussion further for you. Thank you, Edwin. Thanks so much. That was, that was great and it's a very interesting um, and it sounds controversial topic. Um, I, I'm going to let some of the fellows come on as well, so that because the fellows always have really great questions and allow them to answer the questions. But maybe I'm going to ask Juan to to lead this discussion with you, because Juan's really been like you, someone who's been interested in working in this area for a really long time. Juan. Oh, I mean, it was a phenomenal, phenomenal talk, and uh, one of the things that uh, I, I want to emphasize is the. Uh, importance of your trial that you presented at CCC um, um, last year, because combined was very, very unique. Um, you know, we were uh, uh, taught that, um, you know, you would have an intermediate lesion, you would do, uh, 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 you know, um, imaging or uh, physiologic assessment, and you had some parameters to say, this is it, we're done. But, but what I actually think is fascinating about this trial is that you did it the other way around, is you got, you know, physiologic assessment is normal, and then based on, on the um, uh, imaging uh, findings, essentially you determine if these patients had events or not. And, mm -hmm. and what is actually interesting is that the study proved that in, in an enriched population, such as diabetic patients, even if you have a negative FFR, but you have high risk features by endovascular imaging, it's still you can have events. And I really think that's actually a very important lesson. Um, the question is, and you and I had multiple discussions, philosophical discussions over the phone, you know, how to push that forward in the clinical arena. I think that's the, the, the issue. And, and, and we, we all, you know, struggle with, uh, you know, how to really convince the clinical and interventional community that if you have a complex lesion, even though it's not hemodynamically obstructive, that can represent a risk, mm -hmm. you know, for a patient down down the line. So, I mean, I don't know if people really realize the importance of, of this trial, and, and you and I talked about this for quite some time, and, and uh, I was very impressed when you presented that at CCT and continue to be impressed with this type of work, and I really hope uh, in the future we can actually do something to really solve this important question. Well, thank you for the nice comments and uh, for the fellows, I mean, because this is a fellow talk. Uh, if you ever design a trial, look to the evidence that exists and think over it logically and think to the questions you pose every day. One of my mentors ever told me, uh, when you are in the morning, to, uh, you know, when you have a morning report, these are where the most of the questions and debates that you have every day, these are the questions you need to focus on this trial. When it comes to what we do as interventional cardiologists, uh, apart from the fancy things of valves, et cetera, our daily bread is revascularization. And we still, after so many years, have not settled this completely. We have started from angiographically to FFR, and now we're looking to the role of the imaging. So my question is, I, I was very, very fascinated by the prospect trial. I had the chance to, to, to analyze this data myself and uh, with the help of, Natura, of course, of the Columbia group and particularly Dr. Stone, who has done a tremendous work on to this field. And uh, when you look to the data, the data showed you that there are some type of patients that progresses the most, 
And there's the concept of the vulnerable plaque being a non-significant plaque and geographically uh, has gone down, even although the first physiological studies, uh, first uh, histological studies have shown that these are at least intermediate plaques. So that's where we start have to looking. Plaques that we as interventions will think, should I do here an FFR? What should I do with it? Treat or not treat? These are the plaques that also could give you events. Of course, as these plaques progress, they will become ischemic and eventually more vulnerable. But the vulnerability starts at, uh, at a certain uh, degree of intermediate. So somewhere close to 45, 50 and so on. When the plaque, and it's what we have learned, that that's where it correlates with the plaque more than, more than 70. And these are the factors. So we put all this together and we took one question out because if we would put ischemic lesions into this, people will say this happens because it's ischemic. But in fact, the lesions don't rupture because they're ischemic, they rupture because they're vulnerable. And this is the new concept. Um, I'm gonna let the fellows answer some, answer some questions. Um, or ask some questions. Um, you guys can turn on your mics. I, I put on Shun and and Zach. And while they're getting turning on their mics, I had a question myself. Um, so in your study, in Combine, was I mean, did you also look at medical therapies? So statin dose. I mean, these were diabetics. Were they on SGLT inhibitors? Was there a difference between the medical therapy between the two groups? Uh, yes, we looked at that, of course, and uh, we, let's say, there is a lot of trials that focus on the optimal medical treatment. What we did is we took optimal medical clinics participating in the trial, and we assumed that the, 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 the treatment care that the patient gets into the clinic is also optimal clinic, uh, clinical treatment that you can get nowadays in Europe. So you could see that the, this trial might have somehow lower uh, statin rates than what we observe in other trials. The statin rate here was about 70 and was slightly lower, in, but not significantly lower in the patients with thin cap fibroatoroma. But it's not that these did not get the statin prescribed, they could not tolerate it or they, they did not take it uh, regularly. And uh, further, there were no further differences between this. So, in terms of a natural history story, this is a natural history study. This is what happens exactly with these patients. All right. Shun's one of our interventional fellows, so I think he may have a couple of questions he wanted to ask. Yeah, thank you for a great talk, Dr. Kitty. It really um, got me thinking about why I got into cardiology in the first place, because um, you know we all see STEMI patient come in how sick they are, you treat them, the amount of impact you can have on their outcome. I think that's, to most of us, one of the co component of why we get into cardiology. And your talk really gets down to the bottom of it. And um, I think the key question is, you know, just because you can, does it mean you should? Because we at Monty, fortunately, we do like 80% imaging. And that's an amazing place to train. But the um, more you image, the more you feel like you need to treat. And does that plaque need to be covered? All these things, you see more, you feel like you need to do more. And I think Prospect 2 and your study really shows um, that some of the plaque really do need to be treated to prevent events in the future. Um, so my question to you, um, like near IBIS, I don't think it's um, as common. Uh, we have OCT. Um, amount of information you can get from each modality of the imaging is quite different. And interpretation of imaging is quite different depending on the operator. Um, do you have a comment on which imaging should be the one to study? And also the second part of the question is um, out of all the variables like plaque burden, uh, TICFA, which is the key component if you were to choose one or two that we should be thinking, okay, we should cover this? Uh, well, uh, very excellent questions you've asked. And I have to share the same passion with you. I also become interventional cardiologist after seeing somebody getting a PCI from myocardial infarction of the guy after five minutes of talking about football. 
So uh, uh, this is the mentality, and now we have to answer the better questions you ask. And uh, the, the question is, I was uh, with NIRS or OCT? Listen, both look to lipid, but I want to go to show you, I don't know if I can move my presentation more back. And, uh, give you one slide and I tell you what I, why I'm saying what I'm gonna say. I think this slide here, look, in this, uh, here you have group A and group B, so TICFA versus not TICFA. In the group A, 60% of those, so about more than 200 patients, were also fibroateromas. So these you would have seen with NIRS. Look what they give. The event rate of all these lesions is free. And I can tell you, it does not go higher if you isolate these fibroateromas only. This is what I tell you why I'm thinking that just showing that lipid alone, as we knew already from prospect here. Let me show that. Here. That's the answer. That's what you see. Fat without no thing fibroid aroma, no impact. Just fat alone is not enough. The plaque will rupture. The plaque will rupture because there is inflammation. There are macrophages, there is neurovascularization, and these metoperitoanalyses that are there, these rupture the plaque. So a plaque that is thinned, this is the one who will eventually give you more events. Of course, you take a thick, thick cap fibroteroma and wait some time and don't treat the patient rightly, it will eventually become ever a thin cap and it will ever rupture because they start on that. But uh, the ones who are more prone in the imminent future are the thin cap fibroteromas. And you have to add there, as I said, plaque burden, minimum lumen. These are where you have to look. And I think uh, IBUS OCT is better into showing this kind of details. You could see the thin cap fibroteroma, but it's not so simple either. We have learned that what we see is not as, a, as it's designed here, just a little plaque on, on, on a design. These plaques are pretty much diffuse. As I showed you, these are much longer the plaques were carrying thick fibroids much longer than the plaques were not carrying the thin cap fibroids. So, and you could see that these plaques are just not this thick fibroid. They have you could see clearly signs these progress in longitudinal, longitudinally. That's why they are longer. They have ruptured. They have healed. You have signs of a cavity that has been a very old plaque rupture ever and has not healed completely. So these plaques are quite complex. It remembers me what Goldstein in 2000 on angiography has shown those complex lesions. Already now, then you could see those apple bites on your, uh, on your angiogram. And now that I've done a lot of OCT, I can tell you I can spot it on angiogram too, but that's why you fellows you need to do a lot of imaging to understand already when you look to images on angiography, how the plaques are. And the, the, on my question to you, Beck, is that uh, I prefer OCT, although NIRS is also excellent to show lipid, but maybe lipid is not only what we're looking for. One more question, if I may. Um, so using absorbed, obviously, actually makes sense. Um, obviously, absorbed being discontinued, and I heard there are newer BVS being studied and becoming more available. Um, in the future, would you ever consider um, like a regular stent for these kind of high risk, uh, um, for more applicability in the real world when we're ready to say, okay, these need to be treated. Uh, would you even consider uh, treating with a regular stent as opposed to BVS? And is BVS coming back, in your opinion? Well, I don't work for Abbott, so I cannot tell you if BVS is coming back. Let's <laughs> <laughs> say BRS. Is BRS <laughs> coming to come back, Elvin? 
<laughs> but I think there is music in there. Uh, there is definitely music in there. I think the data needs to be more robust, but it's not only the question now we're seeing a vulnerable plug, should we treat that or should we not treat that? I think the concept is more, more we have to maybe rethink the complete way we're doing revascularization and look to the real role of the FFR, the real role of the OCT, how to combine those, when to send the patient for PCI, when to send it for cabbage. For example, I can give you two examples of the same, uh, you could say, on this data, they look like being the same patient, but these patients are not the same. I can tell you a patient with TICFA, FFR negative, and uh, long lesion. You cannot, if you look to this lesion of being, I don't know, 50, 60 millimeter long, uh, two bifurcations coming out, and still not FFR positive, uh, these patients will have an event. The point is you cannot bypass it despite diabetes because the graft will include it's maybe too long and also the treatment with uh, with stent will also be problematic on the long run so it will be hard sometimes to show a benefit you have focal lesions independently if you these are eventually treatable with stents so the whole thing has to be rethought well again on how we treat those patients but i guess what we see is that the event rate, and I have not presented those yet on a patient level, favors revascularization. So but what, one thing actually is interesting, uh, um, over 10 years ago, um, several companies have started developing um, dedicated uh, stem designs for vulnerable plaques. And, and uh, you can yeah, have both them, your, yeah. your intervention <laughs> and, and uh, look for uh, the public actually uh, a first in human with 10 patients with a self-expanding device, low pressure device that had a stroke thickness of um, like 60 microns. And it was like a soft, actually uh, self-expanding structure to passivate and create what uh, Pedro Moreno actually called a neocap, which is, you know, like a neo intima on top of the, uh, of the plaque. And I have to tell you, the field was moving forward very aggressively in that direction. But it was just difficult to 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 um, to prove. I, I think you're completely right. I think there is definitely a role there. And I think I have very uh, we have pre published before. We parallel to this, we have also an absorbed diabetes, and the data was very good because these patients that we treated were these kind of patients that they had very good data. And we did also an analysis compared to Zions. They were non inferior to Zions, but guess what? We have some patients of these analyzed six years after on OCT. You really see nothing. So you see really nothing. You see a complete healed vessel. And I know how these vessels were before. So the concept is there. I think we killed BVS much too early. There is music in there. We should look to much longer data. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Uh, that's, that's a whole different discussion. <laughs> for another day, uh, because we could keep talking that. I feel very strongly about it too. But Zach, do you have any questions? Zach's one, another one of our international fellows. Yes, first of all, uh, thanks very much for the talk. I was familiar with uh, with this trial, the prospect, prospects of the combined, but your take on, on them uh, really enlightened me. Um, so my question goes back to the statins that you uh, discussed. We know that, st that statins uh, cause a plaque stabilization. Uh, for instance, in uh, they can in in cities they can rise uh, raise uh, the the calcium score. Um, so, do you think there is a, there is difference in the uh, the risk predictors in patients which take statins and those w uh, without? You are asking me a question. I, I I like to talk about things I know. And you are up to ask to the people right now, status of statins. I'm more of an interventional cardiologist. I have more of a mechanical approach. So must be not much more than those that everybody knows the statins stabilize, stabilize your plaque. And this is what we see also on, on our clinical practice. I, I, I meant I meant do the plaque. Do the, do the plaque have high risk features in those, in patients who are already on statins and those, those who aren't? I mean, you take, you take a look at, you, uh, you cath a patient on statin, you, t you do the OCT or the NIRS or whichever yes. uh, imaging. We did, we did an analysis on that. And the ones who are taking less statins are clearly more in risk of having prevalence of TICFA. Uh, 
That's true. Uh, there's a, another fellow with a uh, sorry, Zach. Do you have another question, Zach? Uh, no, no, sorry. Okay. No. Uh, you, Alessandro also raised his hand. He had a question. Alessandro is a, a excellent interventional fellow from from San Rafael, then Cotignola, who is now doing his interventional fellowship in Bern, in with Stefan Windecker. Um, Alessandro. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, this is very an amazing, uh, an amazing uh, talk, and uh, uh, it was like uh, uh, continuing with uh, your Montefiore Hospital uh, talk of uh, two days ago. That uh, was also very nice. I want to ask uh, to Prof. Uh, first of all, thank you very much about uh, the integration of uh, PET and uh, other. Uh, uh, possibilities uh, to identify inflammation uh, in uh, in the plaque, uh, maybe with the, the combined use of the CT. Yeah, that's a very good question. So I discussed those things here with uh, some team that are very good on uh, doing PET and doing MRI. And the combination of those two could look like uh, being a very, very good thing to, to, to do. Although if you could uh, put this into practice, imagine these are very nice for, for scientific uh, studies to understand the pathway of disease. On the other thing, and I think uh, on the other perspective, what we regularly do is the CT and there where masses of people have access to. And I think we should look to the ways to integrate uh, very simple pathways of the patients into their screening of high risk uh, clinically, screening with their high risk with uh, modalities like CT, which are available and very frequent to use. I think that one will share my opinion on to the use of CT as an easy uh, CTA. And I believe that uh, we cannot, because of the time it takes, uh, the, 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 the un, uh, not sufficient resources, focus on to PET and MR, which could be the best way of looking to vulnerable plaques. This could be used for teaching and for understanding and for scientific reasons, either in a largely base, you could do this uh, to all patients and get this into clinical pathways, could I see difficult. So I will think that things has to be done easily that give easy access to people to get their themselves screened for eventually having high risk plaques. And this could be done by CT and eventually cath lab. Yeah, completely agree. And uh, one uh, one last question, please, uh, Professor Reddy. Uh, what about DCB in this kind of scenario? Drug coated balloon? Yeah. Uh, hmm. It's uh, an interesting concept, right? Because I'll let I mean, the team give the, the, that talk. Uh, to <laughs> I mean, we were talking about it earlier. I mean, do you really yeah. need a stent? <laughs> to pacify the plaque, I mean, could a balloon with some drug be sufficient to change the mechanics of the thin cap? Yeah. You just need to reset the biological process. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then you don't have all the negative consequences of wondering about, you know, embedding a, a thick strut BVS or PRS into the plaque and what the long-term consequences that are. Alvin, I mean, you think that could be, you know, yeah, it could be. Uh, it could be eventually if it's diffused, very diffused. Uh, if it's focal, I will still prefer stenting and depends on the lumen area and where you're busy with. Uh, if you are mm -hmm. in smaller lumens, you could also opt for not going to occlude and uh, not take extra lumen out of there. And if you are in larger lumens and you're focal, you know, stenting in this kind of lesion, especially if done with OCTs, almost zero events after. Right, right. Okay. Thanks, Ale. There was also, uh, Monsieur Rahman had a few questions. Monsieur, I don't know if you want to ask, ask your questions yourself. You can unmute yourself, or I will ask them for you. Uh, or maybe I'll ask the question. Monsieur had two questions, really. Um, was, are there, do we have any data for left main subsets uh, for vulnerable plaque? And then also, can you, pick up SIGFA on a CT uh, angiogram. C CTA, you mean? Uh, yeah, CTA. Uh, we have, now that you're asking, I have not looked to left main. Uh, that's a good question. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Considering the number of the patients that we had with TICFA being about 100, I don't think that this will be a large subset of patients. Uh, normally it could be three, four, five patients. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we should further do any analysis on this. If you could look to uh, think of fibroadenoma and CDA with this resolution, we're talking about talking to the, the real definition we have now, right now, not. But there are other characteristics you could look at. So uh, maybe yes, but maybe not the real TICFA, but some other characteristics of this vulnerable plaques you could see on CT, like napkin rings, microclassifications. But then you have to have very, very good CTs and specialized okay. people to train on this. Zach, you raise your hand. Did you have a final question? Yes, yes. Actually, uh, I thought about asking this before, and I, I, uh, I took my question back. Now I'm, uh, but it's more of a theoretical uh, a kind of uh, anecdote uh, question. Uh, so the risk of uh, we we don't implant stents uh, because of the risk, uh, the the long term uh, complications uh, and risks of of the the stent himself. Uh, we we have uh, maybe five. Six percent uh, risk stenosis rate uh, classically in the classic uh, literature. Um, do you think that uh, that imaging all the the the, the non-obstructive but high-risk plaques um, and then stenting them, um, we actually have five percent risk stenosis rate, but uh, we can we then have room for for maybe 10, 20 stents uh, if we um up to 20 stents so, to get to get 100 100 percent of uh, over stenosis what, what are you saying is that if we stent these lesions to prevent events the the stent itself carries a risk right carries of plr so yeah. do these two things balance themselves out now let me put it like this first of all you don't have to to screen everybody you have to screen the people who are at high risk and then what i say to you i <clears throat> numbers doing this sort of analysis, you will not be standing uh, more than what you're standing nowadays, maybe two, three percent more. Uh, on the other point is, so you will stand the same number of patients, but uh, you will stand better. I don't agree with you that the restenosis rate is five percent. The restenosis rate nowadays is about uh, two, three percent. And if you do it with OCT, it's 1.2, 1.3. Oh, no, 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 no. So uh, that's, I guess, is a bit my answer. I think we're running a bit of. Uh, I actually got to go because I have a patient waiting. <laughs> <laughs> and we're gonna let you go, Ellen. <laughs> um, thank you for the great talk. Uh, time's up. I really appreciate your time and um, maybe taking this discussion again a little further in the future. Uh, stay well in Brussels, and we hope to see you soon, my friend. Thank you, and you've done a great job. I, I like this kind of meetings. I'm looking them for fun now. <laughs> I look, I look at Join us every week. Discussions. We'd love sure. to have you in.